So I'm hooked up like a patient in a hospital just so I can make sure I get these messages down so I don't have to redo them. All right, we've been studying basics and uh, also on the side I've been uh, reading a little bit of Systematic Theology by Lewis Ferry Schaefer. He was the president of Dallas Theological Seminary and something struck me as I was reading his preface here. It's talking about the job of a pastor and uh, exactly what a pastor should be doing. So I'll read from uh, the preface. It's uh, page 5. It's that little v. It is no secret that the average minister is not now reading systematic theology, nor will such writings be found to occupy a prominent place in his library. Shocking indeed, this condition would have been to ministers of two generations ago, and that would be four or five generations from now. Men whose position was respected in their day because of their deep knowledge of the doctrinal portions of the Bible, and whose spoken ministries and writings have gone far toward the upbuilding of the church. The present situation is not one of a passing moment, and he was right about that because even today there are very few pastors who are teaching the Word of God, but rather um, throwing their books away. As well might a medical doctor discard his books on anatomy and therapeutics as for the preacher to discard his books on systematic theology. In other words, why would a doctor spend all that time studying and yet a pastor who has all these materials just throws it away in order to just entertain the congregation and get their money? And this is not what the pastor job is. The neglect of it must result in a message characterized by uncertainties, inaccuracies, and immaturity. And that is, in fact, true over uh, most of the country today. What is the specific field of learning that distinguishes the ministerial profession if it is not the knowledge of the Bible and its doctrines? To the preacher is committed a responsibility of surpassing import. Men of other professions are tireless in their attempts to discover the truth and to protect, per perfect themselves in the use of the forces belonging to, belonging to their various callings, though these be in the restricted field of material things. The preacher is called upon to deal with the things of God, the supernatural and the eternal. His service is different from all others, di different in its aims, different as to the available forces, and that is, the pastor has the power of God, the Holy Spirit, and of necessity, different as to adequate pe preparation. Few clergymen's libraries will include even one work on theology, but a medical doctor will assuredly possess a worthy work on anatomy. A form of modern, modern thinking tends to treat all matters of doctrine with contempt. And that is definitely true today as doctrine is not taught across the land, but rather people are being entertained. And why should the pastor be any different than the profession of a doctor who studies tirelessly in order to uh, do his profession? And how much more so should the pastor study tire tirelessly when he is dealing with spiritual matters. Now last week we studied the doctrine of salvation and we'll review just a part of that and that is from the direct statement of scripture because we're moving into eternal security. The fact that we are eternal, eternally secure the moment we believe in Jesus Christ and that fact comes out from the direct statement of scripture and we will see that in some of these passages. John 16, 8 through 9, we did this last week. You should have uh, looked these verses up. When He, and that is God the Holy Spirit, comes, He will convince or convict the world concerning sin. Concerning sin because they did not believe in Me. That is the one sin that Jesus Christ did not die on the cross for, and that is the sin of people rejecting Him as Savior. And that is the very reason why if you reject Christ, you will go to hell. And uh, before we begin, I forgot to do the standard operating procedure, and that is to name your sins to God in case you're out of fellowship so that you might understand these spiritual matters. Therefore, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to simply name your sins to God so that you might be filled with God the Holy Spirit who brings to our memory all things. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray.
Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word this morning. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and take the portion of the word which we study and make it a source of blessing and challenge to our life. Now, I was starting with John, in Christ's name, amen. I was starting with John 16, 8 through 9, and we'll continue there. When he, God the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convince or convict the world concerning sin. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me, and that is they have rejected Jesus Christ, and that is the only sin that Christ did not die on the cross for. Our personal sins are not the issue in salvation. They were the issue at the cross, and Jesus Christ has already been judged for every single one of our personal sins. Therefore, God the Holy Spirit, who convicts us with regard to salvation, never convicts us with regard to our own personal sins. The one sin he convicts us of is the sin for which Christ could not die, and that sin is the rejection of him and the, re the sin of unbelief. John 3.15, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. John 3.16, for God loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely born son so that whosoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. John 3.18, he who believes in him is not judged. But he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the unique person of the Son of God. Notice here three times the word believe is used. Not once is the word invite Christ into your heart used. Not once is there an invitation for you to commit to Christ. Well, let me see your Bible. You see this Bible? This While I was studying this week, I looked in here for the verb invite in all of these pages how many pages are in this one some bibles have varying pages because the commentary at least over 1400 pages of scripture you would think that every word in the english language would be used in 1400 pages of scripture yet the word invite is not used once not once so why do you want to cling to something like that? It's made up by man. Invite Christ into your heart is man-made. It's not found in Scripture. And why do I get fired up about that? Because many people have been led astray and have not, and have not believed in Christ because they've only invited Christ into their hearts. And therefore, they're not saved, and it's not even found in Scripture. And yes, I get fired up about it, because if it's not there, why teach it? It's a human addition, and it will not save you. And if you want to look for yourself, then you spend the hours looking over 13 or 1,400 pages of Scripture, and you will not find the verb invite in any case, not meaning anything. I mean, not even in the case of salvation or in any way. God the Holy Spirit made sure that that word invite was not in Scripture so people would not get confused. John 3.18, He who believes in Him is not judged. But he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the unique person of the Son of God. Notice invite is not found anywhere. John 3.36 He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. The issue in salvation is whether or not you believe in Christ once and for all. John 6.47 Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me has eternal life. John 11:25. Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. John 11:26. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And that means if you're alive, that's the only chance you have to believe in Christ. And last week I noted my friend Todd, who was alive and had believed. And I hope you remember that. Acts 16:31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And if anyone in your household believes in Christ, they too will be saved. Galatians 3.26 For you are all the children of God, that means you are all royal family of God, by faith in Jesus Christ. Notice nothing is added to faith. Romans 1.16 I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. This means there is no racial distinction when it comes to salvation. Black, white, whatever, believing in Christ gives you salvation. And if you have any hint of racism in your bones, 
and you think your race is superior for some weird reason, then you have not grown up spiritually. This is not part of it. Everyone has equal opportunity to live the spiritual life, whether black, white, or whatever the race, Jew or Gentile. Romans 3, 20-22 Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law of the prophets, that means the Old Testament scriptures, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, nothing added to believe, nothing added to faith. Romans 3.28 For we maintain that a man is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law. There is no work you can do to get into heaven. It is simply faith alone in Christ alone. Romans 4, 4 through 5. Now to the one who works for salvation, his wages are not calculated, not on the basis of grace, but on the basis of debt. So if you add anything to salvation at the moment, uh, you decide you're going to believe in Christ, and if you add anything to it, that is counted to you as debt, and you are not saved. And that's what it says here in Romans 4, 4 through 5. Romans 4, 14. For if those who by means of the law are heirs, then faith has been made void, and the promises have been canceled. In other words, if you try to work for salvation by following the law or by being moral, you have canceled out your faith, and you are not saved. Galatians 2.16 Nevertheless, knowing that a spiritually dead person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. How, therefore, are we justified in the eyes of God? Romans 5.1 Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The only what means of salvation is one act of personal faith in Jesus Christ and nothing else. To add to faith in Christ for personal salvation means no salvation at all. Philippians 3.9 And may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Notice it's faith alone in Christ alone. Nothing is added to faith. 2 Timothy 3.15 And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And even if you later renounce your faith in Jesus Christ, you are still saved. And this is found in 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. And this is part of eternal security, which we will be studying shortly. And this is the deposition that God has given to us eternal life. Notice it is God who has done all the work, and He is the one who gives to us eternal life. There is nothing left for us to do except believe. And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the person of the Son of God in order that you might know that you have eternal life. Well, that's 1 John 5, 11 through 13. Let me go back to 2 Timothy. Faithful is the word. For if we have died with Christ, and we have, this means retroactive positional truth. We, have also, we also live with Christ. If we endure, that means suffering for blessing. We will reign with him. That means our escrow blessings are turned into our uh, crown of righteousness and the crown of glory that we receive in the millennium if we execute the protocol plan of God. And these terms might be above your head, but we'll get to them eventually. Just stick with it. If we deny him, he will deny us. This doesn't mean that he will deny us salvation. He will deny us our spiritual rewards that we will receive at the Bema seat. And uh, we were just, I was just talking with my dad about the Bema seat. That is where you are evaluated in terms of what you have done with this spiritual life on earth. What happens is Jesus Christ comes up to you at the Bema, the evaluation throne, and says, What have you done with this unique spiritual life? And if you have nothing to answer for except the works of the flesh, and if all of your works are being burned in the fire because you have done these works outside of fellowship, then he will deny you, not of salvation, but he will deny you of eternal rewards. And then it continues. He remains faithful. 
And that, and it says, if we do not believe, that means after we're saved, if we change our minds, metanoia, and say, I do not believe anymore. And I've known people do that. They believe in Christ, and then they get involved in some intellectual thing, and they think they're smart by rejecting Christ. And in fact, what the Scripture says is, if we do not believe, that means after we're saved, He remains faithful. He cannot deny Himself. In other words, if you deny Christ, you are still saved. And because he cannot deny himself, and the abode of God, where God lives, is in our souls. In fact, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all reside in us after the point we believe in Christ. And therefore, since they are in us, we, he cannot deny himself. Therefore, we have eternal life and eternal security. So now we're going to begin a study of eternal security. And that means that you cannot lose your salvation. The worst thing that has happened to Christianity today is the terrible idea that somehow we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have the power or have the ability through sin or some evil that we commit to cancel out the grace of God or in essence to cancel out the fact that Christ finished the work on the cross. When Christ said, Tetelestai, he said, it is finished now, with results that go on forever. He finished the work. Nothing is left for us to do except believe. And if we think we can lose our salvation, then what we are in effect saying is, Christ did not do enough on the cross. Yet he did everything on the cross, and nothing is left for us to do except believe. Now this is for salvation. Now in the spiritual life, it's different. But the spiritual life is by grace as well. What happens is someone, you want to know what happens, why churches have gone this way? Why churches have decided that, uh, well, you must invite Christ into your heart? Why do so many churches preach this today? And why do so many churches preach that you can't be saved, that if you uh, commit suicide you've lost your salvation, and there, or that if you do some horrible sin you have lost your salvation? Why do they think this? It's because of creeps. And that's what the Bible calls them. You see, a false teacher, what the Bible calls a creep, he creeps his way into your home. Now, the home in the early church was where they met to have church. They met in homes to have church. They didn't care about having a big building as uh, people seem to care about now. They simply met in homes where doctrine was taught. And what would happen is these people would creep into churches and issue up a little gossip about another member in the church. Maybe they committed adultery. Maybe they committed some sin that shocks that person. And they say, well, how can that person... That person must not have really believed in Christ. They committed adultery. How? I would never do something like that. Therefore, they are not saved, and they had a head belief and not a heart belief. Or uh, they didn't really invite Christ into their heart. And all of this is nonsense, and all these people are creeps. The big problem with people who reject the idea of eternal security has to do with the fact that they get their eyes on people instead of having their eyes on God. A person who has their eyes on God will understand the grace of God, and they will understand that every single one of us, even after salvation, are sinners. Do you think you don't sin after salvation? Well, you're a fool. First John 1, 8 and 1, 10 will tell you you're a fool. So therefore, a, so they say such a person who has committed such a sin could not be saved. And the problem is, human emphasis over God emphasis. And that is a huge problem in churches today. And they get their eyes off doctrine, which opens up a vacuum in the soul, which is called matayotes in the Greek. And that means you start to allow all these false doctrines to creep into your soul. And you will end up one who is called in the scripture a creep. And therefore, let's look at, um, I didn't write down the, uh, well, it's uh, three six. And it says, I believe it's Second Tim. Look up Second Timothy three six for me. I believe it's Second Timothy, where it says, "For among them are those religious, legalistic, self righteous believers who creep into homes, and that is where the early churches met, and they seduce silly women." Now, women here is an adjective in the Greek, and it is neuter meaning that women is simply being used as an illustration. It refers to both men and women, of course, because men can be silly too. But as a way of illustration, uh, Paul uses women. 
and seduce silly women. This doesn't mean seduce sexually. This is talking about a religious seduction. This is talking about uh, someone coming into the church and saying, you know, this pastor says all you have to do is believe in Christ. But that just seems too simple. What you really need to do is follow the law or do something else or invite Christ into your heart. And let me tell you something. It wasn't simple for Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins. Yes, it's simple for us because He made it simple. So let's see. For among them are those religious, legalistic, self-righteous believers who creep into homes and seduce silly women weighed, out, weighed down with sins led on by multifarious lust. Now, I don't know what your Bible says. This is a correct translation from the Greek. And that means numerous lusts. In fact, they're operating off their area of weakness and area of strength, committing sins both of the sexual category and the legalistic category. Such women are always receiving instruction, yet never able to arrive at an epinosis knowledge of doctrine. Not able to arrive at doctrine, it means they keep on learning out of fellowship. They keep on learning doctrines, and a lot of them are false doctrines, but they're never able to come to a true understanding. And in order that we might not be seduced by these false doctrines that have been given out by false teachers, we're going to take a look at the fact that once you are saved, you are always saved. Now, one, now 1 John 1, 8 and 1 John 1, 10 that I mentioned earlier makes it clear that even believers in Christ sin. All of us sin, and all of us are capable of committing sins that the unbeliever commits. And we will see this when we start studying a few of the characters in the Bible who are believers. 1 John 1.8. Now, 1 John was written to believers. This is for people who have already believed in Christ. Now, 1 John 1.8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, I know of some believers who say, I've believed in Christ and ever since I've not sinned. Well, that is about ridiculous. And if you were to ask that person's wife, she would tell you in a hurry, yes, this person does sin too. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. That's the second cog wheel. And this is uh, part of the more advanced doctrines. But we have self-justification. What happens is, is maybe you gossip about somebody and you say, well, that gossip is justified because that person really did what I'm saying he did. So you justify it. And then you deceive yourself and you say, well, uh, I'm not really to blame for any sin because that person deserved that gossip. And what I was doing, I'm just warning other believers about this person. So that's a part of self-deception. Let me flip this tape over. And I'm going to repeat myself so it'll get on the tape. So a part of the self-deception would be somebody saying, I'm trying to warn somebody in the church about someone else. And that is part of self-deception because that's not what you're doing. You're building yourself up. And the truth is not in you. So you deceive yourself if you think you are without sin. 1 John 1.10 If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Therefore, if you say that you are without sin, you're trying to call God a liar. And God makes it very clear to us that the sin nature resides in us after salvation. The sin nature is not taken away. But a solution for our sins is found right sandwiched in between 1 John 1.8 and 1 John 1.10. And the solution is 1 John 1.9. If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. So there is a solution given in between these two verses which say, yes, we do sin, but God has not left us without a solution. And that solution we are to follow is protocol. It doesn't say, feel sorry for your sins, does it? No. It doesn't say to weep tears of repentance. No, it doesn't. It says if we name our sins. And um, one uh, missionary in Africa, his name is Helmut Mueller, and when he goes over there and he teaches the Word, he has his congregation remember one thing, that when the Word of God speaks, all human discussion ceases. So if the Word of God says, name it, and that's all it says, then all human discussion concerning feeling sorry for sins must cease because it's not in Scripture. And if you find it, bring it to me and I'll straighten you out. 
the, character, the characters we will find in these next passages that I'm going to uh, teach you uh, were sinners, yet every single one of them that we're going to study was a believer. Now we're going to begin with 1 Samuel 28.7. So turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel 28.7. Now in this passage we're going to find a character and he is a real stinker. His name is King Saul. King Saul was chosen to be, by God to be king over Israel. And in fact he was the first king of Israel. In the beginning he was endued with God the Holy Spirit. He was not indwelled with the Holy Spirit as we are at the moment of salvation. But he was endued with God the Holy Spirit. He was a believer in Jesus Christ in the order of Abraham. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. So he looked forward to the cross and believed just as Abraham did. King Saul, however, in his uh, latter days became evil. He started out humble, endued with the Spirit. But later he became evil during his reign. He became filled with arrogance, filled with jealousy. And in fact he tried to murder King David. And he did murder the priest of the Lord, 70 of them. And he murdered them for trying to help David. So here we see a believer committing murder. And not just one murder, he's slaughtering people by the dozens. He's, he's slaughtering believers who were in the Lord's service by the dozens. He lived out his days in jealousy, anger, and he always had murderous intention. In the end, Saul committed suicide. And we see that in 1 Samuel 31.4. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through their work therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. In other words, he did not want to be responsible for killing the king of Israel. And even though he was afraid of killing the king of Israel, he too took his life after Saul took his own life. And then it continues, Therefore Saul took his sword and fell upon it. In other words, Saul committed suicide. Does that mean he's going to hell? Absolutely not. And we'll see this in the following scriptures. 28.7, 1 Samuel 28.7. So Saul instructed his servants, Find for me a woman who is a medium, so that I may go to her and inquire of her. His servants replied to him, There is a woman who is a medium in Endor, and your Bible might say the witch of Endor. That means she was a medium. She was into divination, and in fact she had contact with the demon world. So Saul disguised himself. Now why did he disguise himself? Because ironically, Saul during his reign had outlawed the sorcery. He had outlawed the divination. He had outlawed the necromancy. And if you were caught doing these things, he would kill you. Like uh, uh, driving here, if you look off 85, you'll see somebody who reads your palms. Well, in the day of Israel, they executed people for doing so, and that was by Saul's decree. And now look at Saul. He's so down, low down on the totem pole that now he can't find an answer from God, so he's opened up that vacuum in the soul, and he's looking for answers from the demon world. So he goes to this witch of Endor, this medium in Endor, and he disguises himself by putting on other garments. And he went out accompanied by two of his men. And they came to the woman by night, because they didn't want her to recognize Saul. And they said to her, Engage in divination for me, and bring up for me the one I am about to tell you. Now this woman is very smart. She knows that Saul has outlawed the divination in the land. So she's being very careful. So what she says is, Look, Aren't you aware of what Saul has done, cutting off the necromancers and the familiar spirits from the land? Why are you striking out at my life so as to put me to death? But Saul swore to her, by whom? By the Lord. Now a lot of people, you might think are spiritual, walk around and they say, God bless you, sister, or uh, by the Lord's will, amen, hallelujah, all these things, and you think they are spiritual. Well, here's Saul invoking the name of the Lord. He swore to her by the Lord. He said, uh, I, I promise by, by the Lord uh, nothing will happen to you. And what you notice here is that people involved in self-righteousness, 
people who get involved in the uh, legalistic side, and Saul was a legalist, even though he committed murder and all of this, he had that jealousy part of the sin nature, and that part leads directly to legalism. So what happens here is you see that Saul invokes the name of the Lord. And just because somebody goes around saying, Lord willing, or God bless you, and all of these things, it does not mean they are spiritual. In fact, they are just masking their evil. And this is what Saul is doing. As surely, so he says, I swear to you by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not incur guilt in this matter. So then the woman, uh, being smart, finally realizes that uh, she's probably in the clear in this situation. So she says, Who is it that I should bring up for you? And he said, Bring up for me Samuel. Now this woman was in contact with the demon world. In other words, uh, she had a routine she would go through. And in this case, it was the Engostromuthos demon. Now what is the Engostromuthos demon? It would possess the soul or possess the body of the woman and take control of the vocal cords and make her sound like somebody that uh, from the past that was dead. So the demons would uh, know of somebody in the past. Usually they'd want to bring up somebody famous. And the demons would know exactly how they would sound and act as a ventriloquist through the woman. And they would, in fact, the woman would, in fact, sound just like the person they wanted to bring up. But in this situation, God intervenes. She is starting to go through her ritual of having the Engostromuthos demon possess her by which she can uh, have the voice of Samuel. But God intervenes. And what happens? How do we know God intervenes? Because this lady screams. She screams in fear. Now, she's used to this kind of stuff. Why all of a sudden is she screaming? So here we see in 28.12, when the woman saw Samuel, she didn't expect to see Samuel come up from heaven. That would be Abraham's bosom. You want to know why he's coming up from the ground? Heaven was in Abraham's bosom coming up from uh, Hades or Sheol. Uh, Sheol is a part of it, and that's where heaven was in the Old Testament. So he's coming up from heaven, and she sees him, and she cries out loudly. In other words, she screams. She screams because this is outside of her frame of reference. She did not expect to see Samuel at all. But here is Samuel coming up. And then she screams and immediately she knows she's been had. Immediately she recognizes as a smart woman this is actually Saul before her. And so she says, You are Saul. And then the king said to her, Don't be afraid. What have you seen? Then the woman replied to Saul, I have seen one like a god coming up from the ground. He said to her, What about his appearance? And she said, An old man is coming up. He is wrapped in a robe. Then Saul realized that it was Samuel, and he bowed his face to the ground and prostrated himself. What we see here is that uh, Saul had great respect for his teacher of doctrine, Samuel, but he never accepted that doctrine Samuel taught. So you can have great respect for a pastor, but if you don't get with the doctrine that he's teaching, it doesn't matter. You will end up a failure, just like Saul was. So Samuel said to Saul, and this is interesting, he says, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? In other words, he was enjoying himself in heaven. What in the world? Why are you bringing me up? to disturb me in this stupid manner. I already told you what you had to do in this situation. You didn't listen to me. It's all over for you. And then Saul replied, I am very concerned. And of course he's very concerned. He's about to die. He's about to die to stand face to face with death. The Philippians are fighting against me, and God has turned away from me and does not answer me, not by prophets nor by dreams. Now, in the Old Testament, they did not have the completed canon of Scripture, so therefore prophets would reveal to them the future, and oftentimes God would communicate through dreams. This does not occur today because we have the complete canon of Scripture, and everything we need to know is right there in your Bible. So I have called on you to inform me as to what I should do. Then Samuel says to him, why are you asking me now that the Lord has turned away from you and become your adversary? In other words, why come to me? If God's your adversary, then what in the world can I do for you? Then the Lord has done just as he said through me. Samuel, being a prophet, is telling him, Look, I prophesied these things would happen and you didn't believe it. 
And now it's happening. The Lord has rent the kingdom from your hand and has given it to your neighbor, David. Since you have not paid attention to the Lord's voice and have not performed his fierce anger against the Amalekites, you see what happened was God told Saul to go to the Amalekites and wipe out their women, their children, their men, and all of their um, animals, their cattle. Now, why would God tell them to do this? Well, they were an evil group of people, and he wanted to wipe that evil off the earth. And why kill the animals? He did not want Israel to look as if they had profited from the war. So, therefore, he wanted everyone to know that Israel profited because of their relationship with the Lord, not because they had conquered some land and took their wealth. So he wanted them to destroy the wealth and destroy everything in the evil Amalekites. But Saul was greedy, and he wanted to uh, take a little bit of that money. And he, he, got, uh, he actually went against the Lord in this matter and justified himself. And because of that, God from then on said, You will not be ruler of this kingdom anymore. The Lord has done this thing to you today. And then he continues, The Lord will deliver Israel along with you as well into the hand of the Philistines. In other words, Samuel is prophesying once again, I told you the kingdom would be ripped from you, and now the Philistines are going to take it from you. And this is the next, the next thing that I'm about to uh, say from verse 28, 19. This is where we see that Saul, evil as he was, sinful as he was, even though he committed suicide, he's going to heaven. And how do we know this? Because right here it says, And tomorrow both you and your sons will be with me. Where is the prophet Samuel? He's in heaven. And where is Saul going to go? Going to go despite of himself? In spite of himself, he's going to heaven. So here's this creep going to heaven. And there are lots of creeps today who are going to heaven because they have believed in Christ. And this does not mean it's a license to sin. Do you want to die as Saul died? Do you want to fall on your own sword in misery? And that's what happens to people who believe that uh, you can go on in perpetual carnality. That means perpetual sin. If you go on in perpetual sin, God will punish his children, and it's no laughing matter. So this means there is eternal security, and we can see this from this character in the Bible. And now we're going to move to another character in the Bible who did something very disgusting, something that would shock all of us. And it is shocking what he did. Yet today he is in heaven. And this is a part of eternal security. Turn in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Here it says, it is actually reported. Now this word reported in the Greek means that they are about to be completely and utterly shocked by what is about to be reported. It is actually reported that sexual immorality exists among you. And you say, well, sexual immorality, did somebody in the church fornicate? Did somebody in the church commit adultery? Uh -huh. Well, we'll see what happened. And then the Apostle Paul continues, the kind of immorality that is not even permitted among Gentiles. Now, Gentiles, that is a reference to unbelievers. Gentiles is synonymous with unbelievers. So unbelievers wouldn't even think of committing this sin, yet a believer in the church has committed this sin. So that someone is cohabitating with his father's wife. This means that one of the members of the Corinthian church was committing incest with his mother. Now that's a disgusting sin. And we have a word, a term for it in the English language. I'm not going to say it. It wouldn't be becoming of a pastor to say it. But if you want to know what it is, ask your husbands at home. That's what the Bible says, ask your husbands at home. And then it continues, and you are proud. What's it mean they're proud? It means what's going on is uh, this fellow... Now, how did they find out he was having sex with his mother? Well, he found this out because he had told everybody in some way. Now, you have to understand the Corinthian church. They would get together at the time of communion, and they would all get drunk. They would eat and get drunk together. And a lot of times, the poor people of the church, they couldn't get drunk. But everybody else was getting drunk in the Corinthian church. 
And probably what happened, it doesn't say this, but through deduction, we can say that maybe this man had a little bit too much wine, and he said to everybody, Hey man, I've been having sex with my mom. So he told them, and it's a fact, he told them that's how they knew that he was having sex with his mother. So then the church becomes proud. Now why are they proud? Because they're going to each other saying, That is disgusting, and it is. And they're saying, uh, you know, I would never do such a disgusting thing. Well, that's nothing to be proud of. Gentiles, unbelievers wouldn't even do such a disgusting thing. So then the Apostle Paul rebukes them and says, Shouldn't you have been deeply sorrowful instead that the one who did this might be taken from among you? Now, in other words, the Apostle Paul had a special gift that we don't have today. It's because it was the early church, and the church was just forming. There was not the completed canon of Scripture. The Apostle Paul actually had a special gift in which he could issue to the members of the congregation. If they were out of line, he could pray the sin unto death upon them. In other words, this man was such a distraction to the church. This man had practically destroyed the Corinthian church by his actions, and actually the other people were destroying the church by their gossip and maligning. So this man had to be done away with. So the Apostle Paul prays for his sin face-to-face with death. And if you want to know what the sin face-to-face with death is, that's found in 1 John chapter 5. And it talks about the sin face-to-face with death. And that is from perpetual carnality. If he had had sex with his mother and rebounded it, he would not die this sin face to face with death. And we will see, in fact, this man does not die later on in 2 Corinthians. He actually comes back in the church, and not much, much is said about him, but he actually might have went on to spiritual maturity, which is grace. Now look at 5.3. For even though I am absent physically, I am present in spirit. This is the Apostle Paul talking, and he's talking about the mechanics by which they are going to turn this man over to Satan. For it is Satan who administers the fifth, not the fifth cycle, but the uh, sin face to face with death. And I have already judged the one who did this, just as though I were present. Now this is not a sinful judgment. You see the Apostle Paul is the pastor, or the, uh, the apostle of the church. His judgment is not sinful. If we judge other people, we are sinning. But as a pastor, you have responsibility. For example, if I get wind of somebody soliciting money, or if I hear about somebody who is gossiping and maligning and judging, I have a right to make sure that everyone in here has the privacy of their priesthood so that they can come in here and feel comfortable when they're learning Bible doctrine. They don't have to feel picked on, and therefore, in my judgment, I would kick that person out for disturbing the church. So in this way, this is not a judgment of uh, the Apostle Paul being um, condescending or the Apostle Paul sinning. This is part of his job as Apostle to make sure that his sheep are kept fed without all of these distractions. And then 5.4, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and that is Paul saying that the judgment will be applied at the next church service when they are gathered, gathered together, And I am with you in spirit, along with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he had been granted this special gift of turning over this man to Satan in the administration of the sin face to face with death. And then 5.5, turn this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Notice what is being killed here. It is the flesh, not, not the spirit, not the soul. And then it goes on and says, So that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. In other words, he's saved. And he's going to die the sin unto death. If Paul uh, had his way, he would have died the sin unto death. And he would have went to heaven. His spirit would have been saved in the day of the Lord. So this man committing such a disgusting sin was still saved. And that means any believer can commit a sin an unbeliever can commit. Now this doesn't mean, as I have said, and I need to make clear, that you can go out and raise hell just because you believed in Christ. Notice this man was about to die because of what he had been doing, this disgusting sin. So there is retribution. There there are consequences to the sins that you commit as a child of God. So, but that doesn't mean you lose your salvation. You do not. You can commit suicide, and if you believed in Christ, you're going to heaven. You can have sex with your mother, a disgusting thought. And if you believed in Christ, 
you're going to heaven. Now, in terms of our post-salvation spiritual life, having sex with your mother, and if you continue to do this, you would die the sin unto death, and you would lose all of your eternal rewards. So we have to keep a distinction between pre-salvation and post-salvation. <clears throat> so these are shocking sins that we've noted that have been committed by two different believers and two different sins. We noted suicide and we noted incest, both of which are gross sins, both are sins of complete self-absorption, and yet they remain saved because Jesus Christ remains faithful even if we fail, and we do fail from time to time, hopefully uh, fewer uh, times, hopefully we don't fail as much as, uh, but we will, we fail a lot. So we're going to take a look at another interesting event in the Bible, and we will start that in our next session and that will be John 3, one through John 3.7, and that will be part of the second service. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to study your word. May these things that we have noted, may these things of eternal security, may we take these into our souls so that we can understand your graciousness and the fact that once we are saved, we are always saved. The fact that Jesus Christ accomplished it all on the cross through the word, Tetelestai. It was finished in the past with results that go on forever. Therefore, Father, may these things be a source of blessing and challenge to us. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.